No, I, I, I just said we saved the best for last. So um, I'm really excited and it's an honor to introduce Steve Wallman, um, who is the CEO of Folio and who is uh, a former SEC commissioner himself. Um, why I'm so excited about seeing this presentation, I, I really think that what Folio is doing for the industry um, is is incredible and it's incredibly important and I think what they are doing is they're really building the backbone and the infrastructure that's going to make all of this possible and you know we talked a lot here today about um, you know d developing uh, venture exchanges and secondary markets and and where all this is coming from and 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 we talk a lot about how we make this work for an existing public market infrastructure. Well, where I think what, what Folio does it so interesting is that they actually see it in a somewhat different way. They are able to, um, they're, they're, they're able to, we don't have to turn all of these, these securities into publicly traded securities. We could actually facilitate these transactions uh, in these alternative asset classes, in these, in these, you know, private, private securities, and and they're laying the foundation that's making that all possible and making it possible for in small investors to do that in, you know, in in te the teeniest increments. So I think this is really exciting, um, and I'm really excited to to hear this presentation. So with that, I'm going to give you to Steve Wallman. Unfortunately, what I'm going to cover has nothing to do with what uh, Folio does. Um, so uh, you had, um, I think Blaine uh, McLaughlin has done a terrific job of uh, being able to uh, explain that. Tom Lawson, his colleague, has hopefully um, uh, added significant value as well on the um, public exchange or private exchange secondary market type of panel. Uh, so if there are questions about Folio, happy to answer them, but this is really not about Folio. I wanted to talk more generally about this whole space and really what we've learned over the years and some things that maybe come out of um, a different perspective from my time at the SEC. Uh, I know there have been a number of statements uh, from some folks that might uh, suggest that maybe the SEC hasn't been as foresightful as it might have possibly been over the years, and it may be useful to maybe talk about some of those things. Uh, also, if I could, I'd like to get some questions from folks that people would be not bashful enough to ask them. Uh, just some quick history for folks. Um, the notion about crowdfunding and sort of changing the securities laws in a significant way uh, has been something that's been around for a long, long time. Uh, the securities laws were generally written in the 30s and 40s, but there have been attempts to update them all throughout history. History. Uh, and there were some very significant changes that were done over a number of years. But I had the pleasure of being able to create the first advisory committee on capital formation that the SEC ever had, because the SEC's view had always been to really focus on protecting investors only. And then the question was, shouldn't we also think about capital formation as one of its primary missions? In fact, at the commission during the time when I was there, we actually lobbied for and got changed into the statutory mission for the SEC, the ability for it to include capital formation instead of only investor protection as part of what it was intending to be able to do. So we created this advisory committee on capital formation, and we thought about a number of things. But we thought about some of the basic, more fundamental questions that came up. And I think David Burton maybe has mentioned sort of the notion of rethinking some of these more foundationally. One of the things that we asked the question about is why are we regulating transactions? It's not transactions that are relevant to people, it's buying securities from issuers. So why don't we regulate the issuers only? And think about a sort of concept of company registration as opposed to transactional-based registration. The problem with transactional-based registration is what you're seeing which is now you've got things done on a transaction basis. You're talking about the transaction. You've already heard people talking about the problem, what happens if you do a 506C and you also want to do a Title III and somebody at the same time had started to do a 506B and how do you switch over? What happens? Well, none of that's really relevant if you stop thinking about things as transactions, if you start thinking about things from the standpoint of actually figuring out what matters to the actual potential investor, which is, the fact that they're going to be buying something or they already own something and they're going to be buying more of it on a secondary market or they want to sell it, and that's a share of stock from an issuer. So care about the issuer and care about the information available to the investor. Don't care about the transaction qua transaction. 
Because again, if you do that, the whole concept of secondary trading becomes a really strange concept, right? Because you've regulated the primary, well, what does that mean? That if somebody buys it in the secondary, all of a sudden they don't get any protection? That if you thought they needed protection in the primary, why don't people who buy in the secondary need protection in the secondary? And so the whole conceptualization is starting to get messed up. And that's a technical word. Um, and so what we, what we tried to do was to rethink a lot of this back in the mid-90s. And we came up with a number of proposals. One of them was this notion of thinking not about transactions, but more broadly. Um, when you think about that, though, when you also look at what the federal securities laws were founded on, the idea is that there's a dividing line, public versus private. Public was very simple to understand. It was public. You talk to the public. You offer to the public. You sell to the public. Private was understandable also. You don't. You right? You talk to a small group of people. It's private, people you already know, friends and family, things like that. That dividing line stood for a long, long time. Part of the problem, though, was conceptually, we thought the real point of the federal securities laws wasn't to regulate how you speak, it's to regulate what you speak. It's to basically say, don't tell lies, tell the truth, but not you're prohibited from telling the truth if you're telling it to a lot of people. That doesn't make a lot of conceptual sense, right? Why would you want to stop people from telling the truth to a lot of people and make that your dividing line? What you care about is tell the truth, whether it's to a lot of people or a few people, shouldn't be the dividing line. But that is the dividing line that's in the federal securities laws, public versus private. And so what you see is people starting to think about how do we change some of these underlying concepts? How do we make them more rational? The problem is that's not what's happened. You've had, and I have a somewhat different view than I think some of the people in this room about the benefit of going to Congress. Congress can do a lot of good things. Congress can be a great prod to get regulators to do the right thing. Congress can also mess stuff up a lot. And for anybody who hasn't seen that, just look at anything. Look at our tax code. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really unfortunate. And so when you get people meddling into something like the federal securities laws to take care of a particular problem at a particular moment in time, you end up with sort of a particular answer, but not any rethinking of the overall structure. And so we have sort of fixes on top of fixes, and it's not making a lot of sense. And therefore, you now see the sort of panoply, of the, the whole range, the universe of exemptions that are out there now, and it is confusing. If anybody thinks we now have a federal securities law structure that allows an entrepreneur to actually go out and try to figure out how to raise capital, without having a council and going through it and spending all the money and trying to figure out what the rules are and figuring out which one it is, they're just sorely mistaken. Nobody can figure it out anymore. It is too hard. And so we've, we've ended up making things very complex with the intent of trying to make them easier. Now, there are some people in the mix who can actually help. And I think technology helps an awful lot. Uh, and I think the kind of foundational things that Dara said that we were trying to do, we are trying to do, uh, I think will help a lot. But don't make the mistake of thinking that we've solved problems and that by tweaking in a Jobs Act 2.0, we're going to actually solve a whole bunch of things. There are some really fundamental issues that should be addressed, that people should care about, that people should rethink in the context of the federal securities laws. How many people here are, are actually lawyers? That's a lot of people who are actually lawyers. So you all actually think about these things. You all think about what actually, or should think about what actually goes into it. Uh, but I think it's really very important that we do that. One question that some people, I think, have raised, uh, and I know this gets into some of the politics of it, is why are there securities laws at all? What's the real point? Can't we just simply let people make their own decisions? In fact, in a certain sense, right, that is sort of what some of crowd financing is really about when you talk about some of the exemptions that are out there, 506C. The concept is you don't have to disclose anything in particular at all, right? It's basically hands off from a regulatory perspective. You can say or do anything, uh, any fraud rules apply, but you don't have to give any specific pieces of information. There doesn't, there's no requirement for an audited financial statement. You basically can do as little or as much as the people who are willing to buy from you are willing to demand. It's sort of caveat emptor. And there, the dividing line is they have to be accredited investors, and you have to verify as such. But the concept is those people presumably can take care of themselves. Well, is that really the case? Can they really take care of themselves? So one of the big debates at the moment is what should be the definition of an accredited investor, right? And where do you divide that line? Is it really the case that somebody who is 85 years old and has their spouse die and they get a million and a half dollar insurance settlement, 
that somehow or the other, now because their net worth is over a million dollars, that they can take care of themselves, that they're an accredited investor? Is that really the right place for the law to have drawn the line? And these are the kinds of things that regulators think about. These are the kinds of things that the state folks think about. And for people who don't think that there's elder fraud going on, I can give you ream after ream after ream of folks who are being abused and taken advantage of by folks that they trusted, whether it's their advisor, whether it's a registered rep, whether it's a gatekeeper of some other sort, or whether it's a relative, or whether it's just somebody called from a boiler room and got them convinced to buy something. So when you see these kinds of things from the regulatory perspective, when you see what it is that regulators see when we have to vote on enforcement proceedings and things of that nature, you start to get a little bit of a sense of both sides. And you start to ask the question of where really should dividing lines be. The other problem with sort of a hands-off approach, and think about this, is that bad guys are able to take advantage of it, and good guys are burdened with it. And so you end up with a burden, you end up with a premium, if you will, for the bad guys. They're the ones who are able to actually take advantage of it. You end up with a discount because of the concerns that are imposed on the good guys. And so you end up with a systemic risk problem that's actually counter to what you want. You don't want there to be a discount for good guys and premium for bad guys. You want it to be reversed. But if you have not enough of somebody protecting, you end up with a discount for the good guys. Because you can't tell from the outside who the good guys always are. And so you have to discount them a little bit. But if it's a bad guy, that's fine. You should have discounted 100%. So anything you're willing to give him is better than what he should have gotten. So you end up with a real systemic risk problem. And that problem is not one to be underestimated. And again, I'm sort of going through a whole quick romp here, because I think uh, we only have 20 minutes. And I know that people have cocktails. So uh, I've learned to not stand in somebody's way of a cocktail. Um, uh, in terms of the, the, the other kinds of things I'd just like to, uh, to bring up, I do think, and I was a great advocate for basically what has become parts of the Jobs Act, um, certainly the general solicitation prohibition being eliminated I think is extraordinarily important. Reg A plus being very useful is extraordinarily important. A number of things that I think are there that are really, really sort of uh, potentially groundbreaking. I also think, for example, that Title III can be extraordinarily useful for smaller ones, probably not where you have to do audit financials and everything else. It gets a little bit expensive. But for smaller type of offerings that are truly local, the kinds of things Amy was talking about earlier, that I think are really sort of well, well suited for those kinds of offerings, where you know somebody, and it's a community, and you really have a sense of things. And you can actually walk down the block, and you can see if the guy's actually taking your money and putting it in the place where he said he was going to put it. And you can talk to him, and you can see how it's going. And and you can have the benefit of the crowd going back and providing information to that person. And so the last panel just talked about how do you get feedback? How does the crowd actually participate and make things helpful for people? Locally, wow, what a terrific thing. Not only is it online, not only is it the chat room that we can do, but it's also the guy who can actually walk down the block and say, I see what you're doing, and that's not going to work. Or that's terrific, and that's really wonderful, and I can't wait till you open. That's a really, really nice way to get the community development. That's a great way to raise money. But it only works, obviously, for a small cohort of issuers. Not everybody can do that. If you're trying to build a drug company, it's probably not going to work. One, other things, uh, one of the things that, that was talked about was sort of what is it that goes into making a, an investor uh, care about this? There's, I think, to some degree, sort of an expectation that if we can just get out of the way, if you can get the regulators out of the way, if you can be in a position where some of the burdens of going out to market are reduced, that people will buy, that they're just waiting to buy. And the only thing that's stopping them from knocking on your door and giving you that check is the fact that some, there's some regulator in between saying, don't do it. Well, you know, that's just not true. The honest truth is securities still are sold. They're not bought. And it's really, really hard to get people to part with their money. And that's a good thing, right? However, the fraudsters actually seem to be able to be doing it pretty well. So maybe we should learn a lesson from them. But leaving aside how boiler rooms work, which apparently is quite effective, and unfortunately so, for people who are not in that business, but people who are actually trying to do it right, it can be hard. And if you end up with rules that are intended to protect people on top of that, which create, therefore, the inevitable burden, the sort of send in your tax return and other things where people still do object. And I think as you get more and more potential cyber fraud, there are going to be more and more people who are going to say, why am I sending 
my tax form in to somebody that I don't know anything about except for the fact that they have a URL that stood up and there's an offering that I might be interested in actually buying into. So what you've got going forward is investors needing some way to find good solutions for some of these things. I think technology will solve a lot of this. We are looking to try to figure out how to solve a lot of it. Whether you can get central databases that other people can then work with and rely on, so you've got a trusted kind of mechanism that goes into one place and then people can use that as the verification tool. Whether there are other ways to be able to convince over time people to get comfortable that there are in fact enough uh, pieces of data to be able to determine somebody is accredited without their having to do some of these other things. Whether you can get some of the service providers. Some people who are accredited, a lot of people who are accredited have an accountant or have a lawyer or have a broker dealer. And can they get convinced to finally put in a letter that says yes, this person is an accredited investor. Those are tough right now. Right now, the industry is not willing to do it. Brokers aren't willing to really send that in. Lawyers aren't willing to do it because it's not covered by malpractice insurance in many cases. So if it turns out to be wrong, what liability does the counsel, does counsel have with regard to submitting that letter? So we've heard that from lawyers over and over again. Some law firms are not willing to do that. Some don't seem to be of concern at this moment. But we need to basically solve some of those mechanical problems. But the more important problem is it is still risky. If I went out to all of you or any of you and I said, here's the deal. For the next 10 years, you get to invest in three companies. That's it, public companies. And you have to pick three. What are you going to do? You're either not going to do it or you're going to pick three like you know Google and whatever and whatever. right? You're not going to pick some small emerging company out there. But we get to the private sector and go to private placements and private offerings, we don't go out and tell people, go and make sure you invest in 100 companies and diversify. We say, you have a lot of hurdles to figure out which one or two or three investments you'll want to make. When we think, when you ask people how many private investments do they have, it's a handful. And I'm excluding things like non-publicly traded REITs where they might have been sold at by a broker dealer over years. But in terms of operating companies, it's at most a handful, and that's for sophisticated investors. And that's really unusual that it's even a handful. In many cases, it's only two or three. In most cases, it's actually zero. So when you look at the diversification that folks have, it's zero. They don't have any. If they do a private placement, it's one or two or three. That's got to be solved, right? Because one of the things we've learned is in the public market, if you tell people, just invest in three stocks, and that's all you're going to be able to do, people do really poorly. They don't invest in the right stuff. They lose a third or two thirds of their entire net worth. It's a real problem. And so mutual funds were born in part to be able to solve that. You now have a cost efficient tax, inefficient, but cost efficient way to go out there and invest in 500 companies all at once. ETFs solve it. Folio solves it. We do the same thing. We do it in a different way by letting people create a whole portfolio of securities and doing 100 or 200 stocks all the time. But we don't let people, because of regulatory issues, but also because of the fact that there's just not the timing, there's not the secondary market, there's not the liquidity, there's not the ability to buy them. We don't let people diversify very easily with regard to private securities. Another problem, therefore, that needs to be solved, because we know diversification is one of those free lunches with regard to financial services, right, in terms of investments. If you can diversify, you can reduce your risk, and you can get higher expected returns from whatever level of risk you're willing to take. Without diversification, you give all that up. We've created a whole system on the private side to basically say, no diversification. That doesn't make sense. We're hurting investors, not helping them by doing that. So when you look at all these things, uh, the question is, where can you go with all this? Um, um, one of the things that I think is being grossly underpriced is tail liability. Uh, I haven't heard in the hours I was here Anybody once raised the question of what happens when one of these deals goes south? And you know, if it's 50,000 bucks, maybe it's 50,000 bucks and everybody walks away and says, I don't care. But if you're raising a million or two million or 10 million or 15 million on one of the private placement exemptions or Reg A plus, and it goes down, there's gonna be somebody who's gonna say, ah, I don't think that was right. I don't think that was fair. I didn't understand this. You didn't disclose that and there's going to be a question of fraud and liability. And because the rules at the moment, including the ones greatly put in by our friends in Congress, have required in some cases an intermediary to be involved, 
The intermediary has to sit there and say, what's my liability? And how do I price this? And so you get the sort of dissonance where people are looking and saying, hey, it's just online, just bits and bytes, right? What can it cost you in order to move a security from here to there and just post it? Well, not much. What does it cost you, though, to take the lawsuit when the $15 million offering goes under? A lot, a huge amount. And so all of a sudden, we've created another very significant sort of gap that has to be covered because you've got that tail risk liability that has to be paid for somewhere. And I will tell you that most of the people in this industry at this moment are grossly underpricing what that tail risk liability is. Either they're not even understanding it, they don't even know it exists, or if they do know it exists, they don't care. They either think they're going to flip their company if they're a portal or a gatekeeper of some other sort fast enough to somebody else who they think will be stupid enough to not know, or they are just hopeful that that's their strategy. And hope, I've never thought, was a very good strategy. And so we have, I think, a real problem because if you've got an intermediary, if you've got a gatekeeper of any sort, that entity is going to have to, at some point, price that risk. You can price it by, in part, trying to mitigate it. Right? You can do your due diligence. You can try to make sure you've got your defense. You can only try to go for companies that are good. But the more and more people do that, the more and more you sort of take out, you suck out some of the benefit of the more open, more heterogeneous, more freewheeling, more crowdfinancing type of way of going out and raising capital. And so again, we've got these conflicts. That, again, will need to be solved one way or the other. I could go on for a couple of days, um, uh, but um, can I ask for a question if anybody has one? Or if nobody has one? Well, yes? So you were talking about tail risk, and one of the things that we've seen in our in our relationships with uh, independent broker dealers is a lot of guys are just not doing private placements anymore. You know, FINRA has come down on them. They've had a couple of uh, arbitrations. And so their mechanism for dealing with that tail risk is to just opt out. And so you end up with a much- uh, One way to reduce it. Uh, yeah, an atrophy pool of, of intermediaries. Yep. And I think, the, um, I think there is going to be that very significant problem. It's actually growing yeah, even worse. For example, uh, we are the underlying regulatory ATS for both Lending Club and Prosper for their secondary markets, uh, Folio is. Um, and I can just tell you, dealing with sort of the, the questions that come up from folks who don't understand those markets at all, and just dealing with that, and that's just on the regulatory side, is very burdensome. It's taking a lot of time and it's very expensive. Um, and by the way, I, I, I know somebody asked the question of whether or not it really is P2P or hedge fund to P or hedge fund to C at this point. It really is hedge fund. And it really isn't because of the regulatory issues. It really is because the money is coming from the hedge funds and it's an awful lot easier to raise the money from hedge funds at this interest rate environment at least than it is to try to go out there and get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of retail clients to give you the money instead. Um, so that may change over time. But I will tell you, at the moment, it really is because of the economics. It's not because of the regulation. Uh, that aside, and that was an aside, uh, with regard to this issue of the tail risk, it is significant. Uh, and uh, I think over time, there will be more and more of an effort to try to do more traditional due diligence, but that becomes expensive. Uh, things like the iDisclose, I think, are very helpful. At least you start to get a PPM. But I can tell you that we've seen PPMs come in from issuers. And I used to do PPMs at my old law firm. And boy, it's like, what lawyer did this? I mean, where, where did this stuff come from? Um, and you know, you'll, you'll see things that are just inconsistent on pages. And the problem is, if you let it go out, how could you have done that? If you're an intermediary, and you've got a use of proceeds section in the front that says, this is what we're going to do with it, and you look at the performers, and they have nothing to do with the use of proceeds, and in fact, they're proceeding those things with something else, you know, how could that be other than at least a potential 10 v 5 issue, right? And then where do we stand in the middle? So yes, I think it's a real issue. We are, and you know, Blaine's uh, head is on the line here, uh, we are trying to do our best to try to make sure we mitigate and worry about that tail risk. Part of that means we want to work with other people who we think are credible, good, high integrity, know what they're doing, careful, diligent. Uh, part of it means we may actually, to some degree, have to think about which issuers we want. So for example, we have one issuer up on uh, via Folio right now. But then, I guess people in this room may know it's called Matchbox Restaurants, uh, which is a, a local restaurant chain. Um, but we know them well. 
for a variety of reasons. And uh, they're also a real business, and they've got 50 million or whatever revenues, and they've been around. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a bad offering. You can sort of see what it is. Uh, but when you get to some others that are much more speculative, what will happen when the lawsuits start to come? And I don't know, is anybody here, you, about half the room were lawyers. How many of you are plaintiff's lawyers? Right. Not a single person, right? Um, but I'll tell you, in, you, you have litigated. I don't do that, but if, if I've been in federal court and I've been on the plaintiff's side, I get it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's going to be a real interesting uh, time and a real interesting task. Uh, and I, I think we, we just cannot ignore the fact that there is another part of the bar out there. It's not represented in this room very well. But there's another part of the bar that's going to say, gee, if somebody got injured, somebody should get some recompense. And if the issuer isn't standing anymore, and almost by definition in these cases, the issuer isn't standing anymore, uh, there's only going to be one other entity standing, and that's whoever the intermediary was. So it's, it's, an, it's going to be um, an interesting series of issues to have to wrestle with. Uh, this is not easy. There's a lot of stuff that still has to be worked through. Uh, that is something that legislation could take care of, right? If you wanted to give immunity to intermediaries, if they did something uh, that did whatever, that would be great. Uh, but it has to be absolute immunity because the problem isn't necessarily winning the case. The problem is the cost of getting all the way through it. Uh, and so you'd have to have something that would uh, take, a, take the issue off at the beginning. Unless I've got time for any other questions, or unless there are any other questions, um, I will not stand in the way of cocktails. Yes, sir. Uh, can we take yeah, no, one, one quick one. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, thank you. I want to take shameless advantage of this opportunity to speak to you and ask a very broad question. Um, as, the, the, as the industry matures, there are some inevitable milestones. Eventually, experimentation will slow. There will be some con of consolidation. It will become a little more standard. And inevitably, there'll be some yet to be conceived of competitor, which will be to eat at the bottom of crowdfunding. From your perspective, which is considerable, looking very deeply, what do you see as those phases and what should we look for looking down the road 5, 10, or 15 years? That, that's a great question. Um, my general view on technology uh, and how it can evolve to solve problems like this is that it's, it's always underestimated in the long term. It's always overestimated in the short term. So there's always this view that you know, technology will give you flying cars tomorrow. Well, it, it won't yet. Um, but give it 10 or 15 years, and we may have something that was the next generation nobody could think of beyond flying cars. And I think that that's going to happen here as well. I think what will happen is that there will be the use of technology to come up with other ways of thinking about how you do solutions to some of these things. So for example, take the gatekeeper one, take the intermediary, take the question of liability. One thing that would be interesting, but it will take some time for the law to catch up, would be if you really did do what the law, in terms of Title III at least, is talking about with crowdfunding, with chat rooms, with people being able to see things, with questions and answers back and forth, with interrogatories. If you had no reason to believe that the entrepreneur or the person answering the questions wasn't lying, if you had no specific red flag, um, and that always itself is a litigable issue. But assuming that you didn't have any specific red flag and you weren't intertwined with the issuer, et cetera, you know, all the things that people will argue, can you just simply use that as an outward defense, which is, hey, you know, the due diligence was done by the crowd. And that couldn't have been done before. It was never able to be done before, but it was able to be done this time because you could, in fact, have 1,000 people looking at this. And we can show you that there were at least 100 people who actually did. And some of them were experts in the field, and they did what they were going to do, and people could see all the information. Can that work to basically solve the problem of sort of the gatekeeper liability? Because if you can do that, that's actually going to be the biggest cost. You know, the, the cost of our being able to do the book entry keeping and stuff, I mean, that's, that's a huge technology cost, right? But once we've mastered it, once we've done it, once we've spent the millions and millions of dollars building it, which we've done, it's done. The marginal cost of then doing it is sort of a small amount of time and some other things. But I don't have any good way at the moment of just building something and eliminating liability and tail risk. I need something to do that. And until I can do that, we're not charging 10 basis points for this. We've got to charge percentage points for this. And there's nothing else you can really do at the end of the day. So some of it, I think, has technology solutions. But some of it needs to be done hand in hand with changes in the way the law works. So I would argue very strongly for people thinking about how to make legal changes that can actually work pretty well. The problem is Congress is very slow. 
the SEC can be unfortunately even slower. Um, you know, it should not have taken 20 years from our 1995 report for the SEC to finally get to the point of adopting some of these issues. The SEC should have, I know the fiduciary duty issue came up earlier, that's an abomination. People were talking about fiduciary duty when I was at the commission. You know, we started to talk about what should be the standard for registered reps versus investment advisor, because I was one of the people, mistakenly or not, who voted for and made implementation for the Merrill Lynch rule, which was what started this whole issue on fiduciary duties, which confused the idea of a registered rep and an investment advisor, because we allowed Merrill to basically have asset-based fee accounts, and we allowed them to change the name of their registered reps to financial consultants, I think it was. Uh, I think it was financial consultants. Um, and the problem is, once you have a financial consultant that's charging an asset-based fee, investors, consumers don't see that as any different from somebody called a financial advisor who's charging an asset-based fee and doing basically the same thing. And so if you've got people who are advisors under the 40 Act, you have people who are registered reps under the 34 Act, and they're completely different standards, that doesn't make any sense because from the investor's perspective, they have no clue that they're different standards. Like walking into one restaurant on the block and a different restaurant right next to it, they're both serving food and everything else. One's got all these standards that says they actually clean the back. The other guy is basically throwing trash all over the tables, right? And that one's okay and the other one's not. It doesn't make any sense to people, right? But if you don't know that, you have no way of knowing which restaurant to go into. And what we ended up with was a real confusion of the standards, my mistake. Um, and so, you know, we should have been fixing that over the last 20 years. Instead, we basically didn't. And so you've got now the Department of Labor stepping up saying, well, if you guys won't do it, we'll do it. Uh, and that's where that whole issue has come from. <coughs> so if you can get regulators to move quickly enough, I think it makes sense. I think a lot of pressure coming from you guys, this organization, if you can get something where there's real voice, if you can speak not only in the name just of the sort of capital formation part, but if you can speak in the name of investor protection and investor rights and investor advocacy as well, then I think there's a real chance of moving something forward that makes sense. Part of it, just a warning to everybody in this room, and I'll, I'll just be candid and honest, as you hear, as you listen, so much of it is focused on how do we get more capital into the hands of entrepreneurs, which is a really worthwhile and wonderful thing to do, and I am passionate about doing that. But so much of it is devoid of, and how do we protect investors at the same time so that this all doesn't blow up? And you need to get that second part into the sentence. If you can do that, then I think you can start making real change. If it's only focused solely on how do we get more capital formation, it's just going to get resistance from so many quarters. It's just not going to go anywhere. That was the end of my speech. So, so thank you.